Let's go back, though, to January 1977. It was Inauguration Day when Jimmy Carter, a Georgia man who four years prior was not exactly a household name, became the 39th President of the United States. And during his term, he spent much of his time working on foreign affairs. 1979 signed the SALT II Treaty with Soviet Union leader Brezhnev. But President Carter's greatest achievement was the signing of the Camp David Agreement, where Israeli Prime Minister Begin and Egyptian President Sadat spent 13 days hammering out an agreement that remains the framework for a broader peace settlement today. But Mr. Carter's most difficult task was negotiating for the freedom of the 52 American hostages held in Iran. And that crisis affected, in turn, the President's re-election campaign. In 1981, Jimmy Carter waved goodbye to Washington and the president. We have President Jimmy Carter with us today, and we have a very distinguished audience. And Eileen is going to be uh, fielding questions from the audience a little bit later on. But right now, Mr. President, delighted to see you again. We were doing a little reminiscing because it seemed like every time when he was campaigning for the presidency, when he would visit Good Day, it was an occasion of a sort. First time, you remember? I remember well. It was about seven years ago. I came here, and uh, after I got to the studio, I got a telephone call that my first grandson was born. And his name was Jason, and uh, you all had found out about it even before I did. And you had a nice big cigar with a blue ribbon on it, and I had <laughs> it. Do you remember who followed you on the show? I will never forget. It, that was the main attraction of the morning. It was a, it was a talking dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, the second time you were with us, Mr. President, it was your birthday. I'm not quite sure what you have in store for us today, but we're delighted to see you. <laughs> I know we've been watching the news, and everybody asks you about the change in government in Russia, but. I think, Percival, I'd like to ask you, do you agree with uh, President Reagan's decision not to go? I, that's a decision for a president to make. He knows what demands are on his uh, own time, what his schedule is. Um, and he also, of course, I think the uh, vice president is an adequate representative for our country, so I wouldn't criticize the president for not going. Well, you were pretty well known for doing the unexpected. Remember when you walked in the inaugural parade. Would you, if you were president, have gone? It would have been a bold and dramatic movement, and, and I think without costing us anything, would have sent a clear signal to the world that we are a peace-loving nation. We do want to get along well. We want to cooperate with the Soviets whenever possible. But we're prepared to compete with them and win peacefully whenever it's necessary. But that would have been a dramatic thing. But uh, as I say, I don't want to criticize President Reagan for not going. In your memoirs, you write of the loneliness of being the president. What about the loneliness of being away from the power and the decision-making structure? It's not nearly as lonely now. <laughs> well, Do you I can't miss say that hole that you feel that you might have on things. Yes, events. I miss the hole. I miss being president, but I don't really miss living in Washington and so forth. We've had, got a good life in Plains, but to see some of the basic policies that I espouse and on which I work so hard being changed uh, drastically by the Reagan administration causes me a great deal of concern. Yes. Does he call you? No. <laughs> When you left Washington, how did the family take it? Your wife, Rosalind? Fine. The only one who was really grieved about leaving Washington was uh, Amy. Amy was only three years old when I was elected governor. And uh, when we went to the White House uh, in 1977, five years ago, she was only 10. So she formed all her teenage friendships in Washington in the public school system. And uh, it was a grievous blow to her to go back to Plains and, and have to start all over again with new friends. But she's getting along fine. And uh, it's quite a young lady now. You wouldn't recognize her if you saw her. Well, what about uh, Rosalind? Was she bitter in any way? No, Rosalind had a letdown uh, after, the, after the election. We, uh, at the day after the election, we went to Camp David to, to get reacquainted with each other. We hadn't seen each other for weeks, except just in passing, months, as a matter of fact. We spent a very pleasant uh, week at Camp David, uh, resting, uh, playing tennis, uh, swimming, jogging. We were a very outdoor family. And then when we went back to Washington, I was uh, caught up in a very productive lame duck session where we got the Alaska Lands Bill through and completed the energy legislation and, and passed a, a major bill to, to uh, control uh, toxic waste disposal. And I had to work on the hostage question every day. Well, Rosen didn't have much to do. Uh, you know, a, a lame duck first lady doesn't have a, doesn't have a schedule jammed with, uh, with important events. So she was really confined to the responsibilities of uh, making arrangements to move back to Plains. And I think it, it uh, was much more of a burden to her 
uh, than it was to me. I was still the president in all, every sense of the word, but uh, she was more, more inclined to be responsible just to move home. Was that true? The Washington gossip columnists <coughs> had uh, little things that they would write of uh, that uh, Rosalind, uh, Mrs. Carter, and Mrs. Reagan were uh, not getting on so well. Is that true? No. Th there was really, there was no relationship. They were arguing about the furniture and one thing or another? No, that was, that was silly. One time, I think Mrs. Reagan made a comment, or at least she was quoted as having said, that she wanted us to move out of the White House early so she could arrange the White House for Inauguration Day. Well, that, that was the only little flap I recall. But uh, this very little relationship between an uh, outgoing and an incoming First Lady, Nancy came to the White House. Uh, Rosen and her staff carried Mrs. Reagan through and showed her all the rooms and where they would be living and so forth. But it was a very pleasant uh, uh, visit. You mentioned the hostage crisis, and you write of it in the book. Yes. As you look back, your decision not the campaign, to stay in the White House. Do you regret that? No. Do you think it cost you the election? No, I don't think it cost me the election. There are two or three things I, I believe that were the major factors, but I'm not trying to make excuses. One was the fact that the hostages had been held exactly 12 months to the day on election day, and all of the, the uh, weekly magazine cover stories and everything were on the hostages with bandages <coughs> in their eyes. I think this reminder that we as a great nation were impotent in securing the freedom of those 52 hostages was personalized by me. I was a the president, therefore I was impotent. Another thing was that we had a wave of inflation that, that swept the world because the price of oil in 79 and 80 more than doubled and interest and interest rates and inflation were very high. And the third thing, to be perfectly frank, even here in Massachusetts was that the Democratic Party was split very badly with the Kennedy Carter campaign and we never were able to heal those divisions within the Democratic Party. You write of that in your book, and I was going to ask you that very question. You beat me to the punch. Uh, your relationship with the senator. It was always personally pleasant. In fact, the first uh, year I was in the White House, I think among all the senators, uh, Senator Kennedy had the highest percentage of support for the programs that I put forward. But uh, he's a very ambitious man, and. Uh, it wasn't long before it was obvious that he was being highly critical of me and my administration, almost everything we did, making speeches that under my administration old people were having to eat uh, dog food and cat food, things of that kind. So those, that didn't uh, help very much, <laughs> the relationship, but he had a right to run, and I don't have any hard feelings about it. Well, the man who ran unsuccessfully against the senator here in Massachusetts is with us today, Ray Shammy, and I think even his opponents will say he ran a very good campaign. A losing one as the senator won overwhelmingly again. Yes. Do you think uh, that he'll make the try and can win the election in 84? Obviously, I don't have any way to know. You've come out in support of <coughs> Monday. Well, not, uh, not aggressively, but, you know, when I was uh, nominated for the presidency, I didn't have any, any real opposition left before we got to the convention. I didn't have to horse trade to decide who would be my vice presidential running mate. And among all the people in the nation, after very careful uh, consideration, I chose Fritz Mondale as the man that I would trust most if something should happen to me while I was president, to be the president of this nation. But you I haven't changed my mind. You say in the book it was between Mondale and Muskie. It was. It was a very close call. Now let's talk about uh, the late president Sadat and the situation in the Middle East today. Uh, first of all, your feeling is about for Mr. Biden and uh, the situation in Lebanon. Yes. Uh, has Israel's uh, relations the United States been irreparably damaged? No. I think the bottom line on our Mideast policy is the uh, existence and the security of Israel. Th above all other things, that's what I think is our best investment and our best commitment. And I think it's unswerving among the American people, not just the political leaders. Uh, I called President, I mean Prime Minister Begin this morning to express my condolences about the death of his wife, Elisa, who was very close to him. Uh, they were together at the White House several times, just a private supper with me and Rosa. And of course, she was with him during the entire Camp David negotiations uh, and, and is a, was a stabilizing factor in his life, very dear. They were just as close to one another personally as, as Rosalind and I. And he confided in her, but she uh, played, as you know, a quiet role, uh, which was her preference. She was a very strong-willed, very fine woman, and I deeply regret her death. But I, I would say that, uh, that Prime Minister Begin at Camp David uh, 
made some very heroic political decisions. I don't think any of his predecessors, even great leaders like Ben Gurion or Mrs. Mayer, would, would have had the political courage to uh, agree to withdraw completely from the Sinai, to dismantle the settlements around Yamit, and to sign the peace treaty with Egypt on those terms. However, I, I have to say very quickly that I, I believe the reason Prime Minister Begin did it was his ambitions to hold the entire occupied territory, the West Bank and Gaza, which I think is a very serious mistake for Israel. Could that Camp David agreement have been worked out without uh, Sadat? And if... No. All right. That, that uh, we all assume. But was he too close to that for the rest of his Arab neighbors? Did that hinder him in any way? Sadat uh, was a man, he was my favorite among all the foreign leaders I ever met, and I met more than a hundred. He was bold, courageous, generous. He was willing to take a chance uh, politically. He was willing to uh, risk the uh, extreme displeasure of all his other Arab brothers in order to find peace with Israel and therefore for Egypt. He looked on himself as, uh, as kind of a descendant of the Pharaoh, someone who had to stand tall and never flinch in the face of pressure. Uh, when when uh, he would get into an uncomfortable position like at uh, Camp David, he would uh, retreat into the broad strategic uh, analyses of, of how the world and his region was going and, and what the role of Egypt would be. So I had a great admiration for him in every, every way. As I said in the book, and, and I think the most interesting part of it, uh, Sadat trusted me too much. He and I were personal friends, and uh, our families were close. Uh, our children liked each other. When, they, when, they, when Sadat's uh, young people came over, his, his children and, and, and young in-laws came over, they, they traveled around with my boys and their wives. So we had a very close relationship. I guess that was part of what I said in the second part of that question, is being too close to that Camp David agreement. It was almost as if, if he was trying to write his epitaph. Thank so that was so uh, courageous that he ignored the potential danger to himself. Uh, he was well aware of the radical nature of some of the uh, groups in uh, Egypt and throughout the Arab world, but he just stood tall and did what he thought was right. What about his successor, Mubarak? I have a great admiration for Mubarak and a very good chance to know him. During the last six or eight months of, of my term and subsequently, uh, Sadat trusted Mubarak completed to carry out foreign policy. He had already been a, a great uh, military leader, as you know, during the 73 mm -hmm. war. And when Sadat came down to Plains to see me after I was no longer in office, a little more than a year ago, uh, he told me that, that in April of 1982, which would have been this past spring, he was going to step down as president, that his term in office was over, he had accomplished all the major things that he had on his agenda, and that Mubarak was ready to take, take charge. Of course, Sadat never had a chance to retire. And, uh, but I think in every way that Mubarak has acted since uh, Sadat's death, so far as I can judge, he's acted as Sadat would have done uh, in reaching out a hand of friendship to his fellow Arab leaders uh, and consummating the peace treaty and taking the Sinai back. I think Sadat and Mubarak were completely in harmony on the major issues. The question of the Israeli involvement in, in Lebanon and the massacre what are your feelings on that? Oh, horror. I think this is one of the most horrible things that's ever happened since I've been an adult, at least. It's a tragedy for, for, for Israel, for the Mideast, I think, for us, to have had this, uh, this event. Do we know everything yet? No, I don't think so, and I'm not trying to be presumptuous about that. I don't, I'm not trying to lay blame on any particular person or persons, but... Uh, I think the ab abuse there exemplifies the hatred in the Middle East that does exist between religious groups and, and between those who've been at war so long. I think it doesn't uh, indicate a, a lack of importance of the Camp David Agreement. I think it indicates, on the contrary, the importance of that agreement, which did spell out in a very fine way, not in legal language, but in, in peanut farmer language, how Israel could exist and be secure, how she could have peace with her neighbors, how the Palestinian issue could be resolved in all its aspects, how the withdrawal of Israel from the occupied territories could be combined with full autonomy for the Palestinians and searching out the, the final status of the West Bank and Gaza. All these issues are covered very specifically in the Camp David Agreement, signed not only by Sadat and me, but also signed by Prime Minister Begin on behalf of Israel, 
and later ratified by action of the Israeli parliament. So it's a, it's a basis for peace. I, I noticed that in the uh, Time magazine write-up about uh, the new Secretary of State, George Shultz, he was quoted as having said, everything that we need for peace in the Middle East is included in the Camp David Agreement. And since it has been signed by the most powerful Egyptian uh, 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 Arab nation, Egypt, and also by Israel, it is a good foundation. But there are some things uh, in semantics that make it difficult for people to come forward. The uh, Palestinians and Jordanians find, a hard, find it hard to come in under the Camp David Agreement. It'll have to be called something else, but the premises will stand. Uh, one of the th strange things you felt was at one time you were sitting in the, in, in, living in the same living quarters as Richard Nixon. You want to explain that, what your feelings were? Well, when I first came to the White House, I was obviously uh, uh, impressed with the history of it. And there would be little things sitting around on the table, for instance, a writing desk that Thomas Jefferson <coughs> had made with his own hands. <coughs> and he would carry that writing desk around with him in a, in a buggy or on the back of his horse. And it was in the same room, by the way, where Franklin Roosevelt in his wheelchair would, would go in with, with uh, Winston Churchill, uh, called a map room, and look at the maps that uh, we used as uh, strategy sessions for the Second World War. And of course, other mementos were more recent um, with President Nixon and, and Kennedy and Johnson and, and Ford, of course. You're not using the word ghost, but did you feel like there was uh, a ghost there? No, the, the first movie we saw, I think, in the White House was All the President's Men. <laughs> and, <laughs> and to be sitting there and thinking, well, I hope I don't disappoint the nation, you know, this was a very important consideration. For I hadn't me. thought of it before, but what do you think about the political fortunes of Richard Nixon? Do you think as the phoenix he will rise again, yet again? Not as a political force in the country, but uh, I consulted President Nixon uh, regularly when I was president, as I did President Ford. When I was uh, negotiating to uh, normalize relations with China, I called on President Nixon for his advice and counsel. It was very, very uh, helpful. And when we had the uh, banquet when Deng Xiaoping came over, uh, I invited President Nixon to the White House. I thought it was the appropriate thing to do. And as you know now, on the television programs and so forth, quite often he is consulted because he's known many of the great leaders that served at his time. I, I always felt that when I was uh, negotiating SALT II or the uh, Panama Canal Treaty or normalization with China that had been commenced at least in some ways by my predecessors, that, that I should involve them in the process. Do you think time will treat him better? My guess is that it will, yes. I, I don't mean absolve him of, of the falsehoods that were told and so forth, but yes, I think that in general people will, will sympathize with him. Well, I think it's already happened. You, there's also, the, I wanted to ask you about, uh, President Reagan asked you, of course, to immediately fly over and greet the hostages uh, when they returned. Uh, he also sent you as our country's emissary to the funeral of President Saddam. Did that make you feel any better towards uh, Mr. Reagan? Well, I don't feel harsher toward President Reagan. My preference with the Sadat funeral was for me and Rosen to go on a commercial airplane and, and no, just... No, you want to go as a private citizen. I wanted to go as a private citizen because uh, uniquely among all the families of heads of nations, uh, Sadat's family was close to us and we just wanted to go as private citizens to, to be with Jayon and the children and to let them know we cared about them. But when, when the White House announced that the three former presidents would go, it would have been an embarrassing thing for me to refuse to go. And I didn't look forward to that trip with Nixon and uh, Ford. I have to be frank with you. Oh, but you're right surprised. You were surprised, weren't you? <laughs> it turned out well. Yeah. <laughs> it's in the book. All right, Eileen has some questions. Well, a man who's just come off of the grueling days of campaigning, something that you know very much about. Uh, Mr. John Sears is with us. He was our Republican candidate for governor. Good morning, Mr. Sears. Mm -hmm. Any comments or questions? Well, I have, uh, Mr. President, a few days ago, a group of people went aboard a submarine in New London and desecrated the vessel. She was named the Georgia. Yes. And one of the uh, people involved is a woman who came from Newton nearby. And I wondered, since you're no submariner and the name of the ship, uh, this comes mighty close to home. Uh, have you a reaction to this kind of episode and an overview of the whole nuclear freeze proposal? I was uh, the senior officer of the second atomic submarine when it was being built, working under Admiral Rickover. I was a submarine officer. My wife was there when the keel was laid on the USS Georgia, and uh, of course it's named after my state. But in spite of all those uh, personal 
relationships I have, I think it's a very serious mistake for Americans to, uh, to desecrate any uh, effort by our government to defend our country. Uh, I'm against war. I think the people who are against war most strongly would be those who have been in the military who are still there, who would be the first ones to die in case of an attack. But the best way to prevent war is to be adequately uh, defended. If the uh, Soviets or any potential adversary ever thought that we would uh, lie down and uh, surrender ourselves to communism or totalitarian government, give up freedom, give up the right to defend ourselves, that would be the best way to precipitate war. And so I always felt that we had to be strong for peace and that we had to be resolute as Americans have always uh, been. It hasn't been the, the history of uh, people of Massachusetts to avoid uh, conflict if it, was, if it was necessary to achieve freedom. Some of the greatest uh, historical stories of America's uh, fight for independence were, were made right here in Massachusetts. So I think to desecrate a, a, a part of our nation's defense is an ab uh, abominable act. We also have Mr. Ray Shamey with us, Mr. President. He took time out from his campaign. He's currently running for the Senate as a Republican candidate against Ted Kennedy. I How was. are you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> have you? Have you any questions or comments? Yes, I, I do. As a matter of fact, uh, in recent months, there's been considerable speculation that the Soviet Union and mainland China might get together and negotiate their differences and ultimately close ranks. Um, with the new Russian leadership, do you think that this is more likely or less likely? And if more likely, what should American foreign policy be in that event? I thought one of the greatest uh, opportunities that I had when I was president was to normalize relations with China to finally reach out of hand a friendship to the Chinese people, more than a billion, as you know, a, a powerhouse uh, in every way uh, in the Western Pacific region, and say, we want to have a stable and predictable relationship with you. This was initiated not by me, but by President Nixon in Shanghai with the Shanghai Communique. It went into the doldrums for about five or six years because uh, of the strong Taiwan lobby, and then we consummated the act. Since then, as you know, President Reagan has equivocated. It's no, there's no way to tell what President Reagan's uh, policy is. During the campaign in 1980, he said we ought to cast aside the Chinese relationship and move back toward Taiwan. But I think under the urging of both uh, Secretary of uh, State Haig and Schultz, the Reagan administration has modified its position. Because of that equivocation, because the Chinese don't know what we're going to do or what our policy is, they've reached out feelers to the Soviet Union and now they have begun, again, uh, negotiations. My guess is that um, General Chairman Andropov in the uh, Soviet Union will take advantage of this opportunity if he can. It would be a great achievement for the Soviet Union to move back toward a more normal relation with China. I n always avoided the so-called playing of the Chinese card. It would have been counterproductive for us to align ourselves with China against the Soviet Union. There ought not to be that kind of thing. But we should strengthen our ties with China and let them have confidence in us and have a stable policy. And I hope the Reagan administration will correct a very serious error that they have made in this first uh, 18 or 20 months. There's a face here that you might remember. Can I get you to stand up, Lucy? Yeah. Lucy Watkins, who was a part of your staff, the Southern Regional Council, is now Thank Executive you. Director of Jobs for Youth. Uh, Mr. President, I feel like I should say, Jimmy, <laughs> since you left Washington, I had to, too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it seems to me there's been a lot of fragmentation among us Democrats. Is the fragmentation beginning to get over? I've noticed a, a very close parallel between the time I took office in 1977 and now. At that time, we had three or four years of absolutely stable oil prices, and inflation was going down because oil prices were not going up. Also, the, the number one issue in 1976 was, uh, was jobs. Everywhere I went, it was how are we going to cut down this horrible unemployment rate, which at that time was almost 8 percent. Now, as you know, it's 10 and a half percent. And so the main thrust that I took into the White House was to create jobs and try to, to stifle as best I could any resurgence of inflation. We created uh, 10 million jobs, as you know, with your help while I was uh, in office and cut the unemployment rate way down. Now there's a growing sense that uh, our country is worse off economically than was projected with the campaign rhetoric leading up to November the 2nd, this just past election. We've got uh, the highest number of people unemployed in this country in history, even more than the Great Depression as far as total numbers go.
a higher percentage of these unemployed people who are not any longer drawing unemployment compensation so their families are particularly afflicted. We've got the highest number of uh, bankruptcies every week that we've had in 50 years, the lowest farm income in 50 years. World trade is actually going down for the first time in 50 years. So we've got an underlying current of economic woes that haven't been yet assessed. And I think that, unfortunately, these kinds of problems will tend to, to bring the different interest groups together who are particularly concerned about afflicted people or deprived people. One other point I'd like to make from a Democratic Party point of view is that I think the recent reforms that have been made in the Democratic Party rules to bring into the convention those who are directly involved in politics would probably be a stabilizing factor. As you know, after the 1968 convention, Hubert Humphrey suffered horribly. After the 72 convention, the party was still split. The same thing in 76, the same thing in 80. But I would guess in 84, the Democrats will come out of the convention with a much more unified party and a realization that everybody would have to get behind the nominees, whoever they might be, for presidency and vice president. You know, I asked you before uh, how you felt history would treat Richard Nixon. Yes. Let me ask you the question of yourself. How do you think history will treat Jimmy Carter? Maybe not well enough to suit me, but better than we think now. <laughs> well, I, I, I and that's one of the reasons for writing a book was to explain the back um, of, of stories that were sometimes not adequately reported at the time. Uh, the personal relationships and, and what we hope to do and how we measured ourselves. And I think most people have said that the uh, book is fairly frank, that I have pointed out not only achievements but also failures and um, I would say that in foreign policy, we did well. We kept our nation at peace. We strengthened our defense capacity. And I always kept in the forefront of, uh, of the world's consciousness that, that we as a superpower were always striving for peace, not just between ourselves and potential adversaries, John, but also in other troubled regions of the world. The Mideast is the most notable example. Secondly, we were always in the forefront of nuclear arms control, striving to reduce nuclear weapons and nuclear arsenals, working toward an ultimate day when we wouldn't have nuclear weapons at all. Third, we never failed to be in the forefront of searching for enhanced freedom or human rights for people all over the globe. And fourth, I don't think we ever deviated in the consciousness of the world as being in the forefront of searching for higher quality of our environment. So those kind of things I think will be uh, on the record. I think my assessment is accurate. And of course on domestic uh, programs, the energy legislation, the Alaska Lands Bill and others will be looked on favorably. Did the press treat you fairly? I didn't think so at the time. Uh, most of the days I was disappointed with the headlines. They didn't uh, show what a, a great achievement we were uh, offering to the American people. Mm -hmm. But that's inevitable. When I compared, though, the way the press treated me with how it treated uh, Thomas Jefferson or uh, Abraham Lincoln or Harry Truman or Lyndon Johnson or Richard Nixon or even Jerry Ford, I think I came out well. Well, we're going to, uh, yes, Eileen, did you Well, I just found it very poignant in the book when you were talking about trying to collect all of the Iranian assets that were frozen from the 12 American banks, and you'd spent two nights up all night prior to Reagan's inauguration address and your final day in office, and you said you went in to change your clothes for that morning, and you looked at, in the mirror at yourself, and you <laughs> said, oh, my, have I aged that much with this job. Was it worth it? Yes. It was worth it. It was the most exciting and challenging and gratifying four years of my life. The time just passed exceedingly very quickly. And even on the days when I knew that we would have uh, disappointments and failures and unpleasant encounters, uh, I never once got out of the bed, and I got up early, that I didn't look forward to getting to the Oval Office and dealing with the nation's problems. It was an honor for me, and, and I, I hope, I know it was worth it to us. I believe it was worth it to our country.